Okay, so thanks everybody for this opportunity to talk about a topic that for most of you guys who may or may not know me already, this is one that's near and dear to my heart. I've been in the field of now nephrology for more than two decades going on. And this is a topic that unfortunately still two decades later doesn't get the kind of attention that we keep hoping would be getting. So let me dive in a little bit into the information. I want to give you guys a lots and lots of opportunity to ask me any questions and anything that may be on your mind. For those of you guys who know me, I love quotes. This is my favorite quote. I know all of you guys love it. My only ask is this is mine. Get your own. I'm totally kidding. Just a joke. So let's talk a little bit about something that is a lot more serious of a topic, which is kidney disease. The reason we want to talk about kidney disease is we talk so much, in my opinion, about things like heart disease, cancer, all sorts of other things, because when you have those diseases, you can clearly notice the symptoms. You know you have chest pain going on. You know that there's heart failure because there's fluid building up in the legs or it's building up inside the lungs. There's shortness of breath going on. But what makes kidney disease so devastating is that when you have it, there is usually not only no symptoms early on, but oftentimes even in the later stages, you'll find that people walk in and they don't have symptoms going on. In fact, when it comes to prevalence, the prevalence of kidney disease is anywhere between one in six or one in seven going on, depending on the population. But here's the real kicker. 90% of the people who have kidney disease don't know they have kidney disease going on. And so when we start to think about the fact that there are so many folks out there who have kidney disease and they don't even know it, this becomes incredibly important to understand one, how do you even know if you have kidney disease? Two, what should you do to try to prevent it? But when you talk about kidney disease, there's actually three main causes. And the third one, of course, is related to these two, which is really diabetes and high blood pressure. So diabetes and high blood pressure are your main causes. And the third one is obesity. Now, when we talk about dialysis and the risk of kidneys getting worse, not all ethnic groups are the same. In fact, in terms of the overall risk, Caucasians have the lowest risk, but the highest risk is found in African-Americans where the risk is about four times higher. Native Americans have a higher risk, Asians have a higher risk, Hispanics have a higher risk. But the reason this matters so much is because in African-Americans, the number one cause for leading to dialysis happens to be high blood pressure that goes untreated. Now, what matters to me so much is trying to raise attention about this issue of kidney disease, because when we go back and talk about this, what we find is each year kidney disease ends up killing more people than breast or prostate cancer. And as a result of that, you would think that there would be so much more attention, but still, it is one of those things that is almost looked upon as a black box. And yet there are so much that we can do in terms of lifestyle and even in terms of combination of lifestyle with some of our newer treatments that can make a substantial impact on where you are right now. So today's talk is not so much on the medication side, but it's going to focus on the lifestyle side, really, in terms of what is the evidence-based message that you want to take away from this talk in terms of vital nutrients. Now, this is going to sound all complicated, but it's not. As we get into each one of these, you're going to find it's actually quite simple to be able to understand this concept. So we're going to talk about salt, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, protein, fats, fiber, sugar, but we're going to do this in the sense that we're going to come at it from the angle of how does your diet determine your future? And so with that, let's start with the first one. When we start with sodium, what we know about national guidelines around sodium is, is there are all sorts of different national guidelines coming out. There are different bodies that sort of say, this is what you ought to do if you have chronic kidney disease going on. And some will say aim for less than 2.4 grams per day of sodium. Some will say less than two grams per day. Generally speaking, when you're in that range of less than two grams, you're in a good place going on. Majority of sodium that people consume comes from not that salt shaker that's on your table, but it really comes from all those eating out, has insane amounts of salt. One meal eating out at a restaurant can easily give you over a gram to two grams, easily. So 
a lot of the food comes in anything that's processed, anything that's packaged. That's where the sodium is, not your salt shaker. So with that, what we find is, is when we talk about high blood pressure, diabetes being the biggest culprits with high blood pressure, salt is a big deal. And what we know is if you start to restrict somebody's salt, just the act of restricting somebody's salt can have an equivalent effect on blood pressure that's equivalent to about one blood pressure medication. So imagine a typical blood pressure medication gives you about 10 point improvement. So one blood pressure medication, let's say your blood pressure is 140. Your doctor is saying, let's get it down to 130 or less. If that's the case, one agent is sufficient. It will bring it down roughly around 10 points. But if you look at what lifestyle can do, just reducing the sodium component alone can bring it down almost 10 points going on. Not only does that happen, but if you go ahead and go on a low sodium diet, in addition to that, you'll also get a dramatic reduction in protein in the urine. Why do we care about protein in the urine? Because proteinuria or protein in the urine is the biggest risk factor and is the single best way to know how quickly you are going to progress to dialysis. So if you said, you know, what are my risks for going on to dialysis in the future? How can I make sure of all of this stuff going on? Look at the protein in the spilling. The more protein you spill, the faster you're going to progress to dialysis. All right. The other stuff that's there is, is even though when you start to restrict things like sodium, you may not see a difference in other markers going on. What you know is that if you can reduce the protein in the urine, if you can reduce the blood pressure, you will absolutely lower the risk of people progressing to dialysis. And because of that, it makes all the difference in the world to focus on trying to reduce your salt intake as a primary modality for kidney protection. Now, this is an older study. This came out in 2011. But the reason I bring it here is because when people talk about medications, they often forget medications alone are okay. Medications, when you combine them with lifestyle, get supercharged. What do I mean? Well, in this particular study where they use patients either with an ACE inhibitor or combining ACE inhibitors with a low sodium diet. Look at what a dramatic result is. So when they did an ACE inhibitor with a regular sodium diet going on, what they found was that people were spilling protein in the urine. It got better. But what they found was as soon as they added a low sodium diet, they almost doubled the effects of the medication going on. So imagine instead of trying to say, doc, my protein is not controlled. The doctor says, now you need another medication. What if we're able to reduce your pill burden and simply by adding lifestyle, we can go ahead and give you almost a hundred percent improvement over where you're at. That's pretty amazing. Now, potassium is one of those things that gets such a bad rap. And, you know, it's, it's really poorly understood what potassium is, because what you want to understand about potassium and why it's so misunderstood is because high potassium will kill you and low potassium will kill you. Yet, potassium is one of the most critical things in our body to make sure that we have in the ideal amounts. And in our kidney patients, the worse your kidney disease is, the harder it is for your kidneys to get rid of potassium. So oftentimes as people's kidney disease gets worse, the blanket recommendation is, is we need to cut down their potassium. Now, our job, as physicians, as healthcare providers, as dietitians, is to make sure we individualize for the patient. And what that means, let's dive into it a little bit so I can explain it. But first, once again, guidelines. So what do the guidelines mean? So look at Kadoki for the middle uh, box for a second, because this is probably the best way of understanding why this is so crucial to get an idea of potassium is when you have a tiny bit of kidney disease, having higher concentrations of potassium in your diet are actually healthier for you. And you want to get your potassium not through a supplement, but by eating lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, because they will give you the best potassium, the best absorption and all of the pleiotropic benefits that you're looking for anyways. But what you want to notice is in early kidney disease, the recommendation is greater than four grams per day. In later kidney disease, 
the recommendation is to drop that down almost by 50% going on. And why? Because your clearance goes down. But let's dive a little bit deeper into it. When we start to look at potassium and what happens if people take potassium foods and blood pressure, what's really fascinating is, is we talked about cutting salt and how cutting salt is equivalent to one blood pressure medication. But take a look here. Adding potassium through foods is equivalent to another half a pill right there in terms of blood pressure support. So how cool is it and how fascinating is it that if you just want to improve your blood pressure health, you can lower your salt and you can start to add fruits and vegetables and what happens to your blood pressure? It goes down and it does so, so well that you may not need the same number of pills or you may not need any pills for that matter going on. So very fascinating to see how we can change these things going on. Even when we talk about things like chronic kidney disease incidence, which means what is the likelihood of you developing chronic kidney disease? And by the way, I love coffee. <laughs> coffee is not part of this talk, but coffee and kidney disease is a fascinating topic where the, the incidence of kidney disease is actually lower the more coffee you drink. And part of that has to do with the antioxidant benefits, but I'm a big coffee fan. <clears throat> so with that, let's go into potassium intake and CKD. So what we find is, is as we start to look at folks who take the lowest amount of potassium intake versus the highest, the lowest is more linked to getting chronic kidney disease versus the more you end up taking in potassium, the lower your risk of developing chronic kidney disease. The take home message here is very simple is, if you wanna get more potassium, stick to whole foods, fruits and vegetables are excellent. Of course, same thing with things like nuts going on, avocados, et cetera, going on. Those are excellent sources and you wanna be able to use those things to be able to change how you eat. Now, calcium is something that people are absolutely obsessed with. And what is tricky about calcium is, is there's so much marketing and hype around making sure that folks are getting enough calcium, but taking in calcium supplementation doesn't mean your bones are just going to uptake it. The only way your bones are going to want to take up calcium is if there's a need. And what I mean by that is, is if you do any kind of resistance training, for example, you're stressing the bones. When you stress the bones, they want to get stronger. When you stress a muscle, the response of the muscle is to get stronger. So if you want to get bigger muscles, you don't get bigger muscles by sitting there and just trying to focus on taking creatine all day. You focus on trying to lift weights. And as you lift weights, what ends up happening is this you're causing micro tears, you're stimulating the muscle, the muscle repairs itself as it does, it does it stronger. Same thing with bones going on. So there's this idea that folks forget about exercise, but focus way too much on the idea of trying to supplement. Now, when it comes to chronic kidney disease, there's a lot of controversy on what is the optimal amount of calcium that ought to go in. But it's a fascinating thing because when we start to look at calcium balance in chronic kidney disease actually becomes quite concerning. This is an older study, but this is a really well-designed study, very small study. But the reason it was so interesting was in this particular study, what they wanted to see was what was the difference between giving somebody 800 milligrams versus giving somebody two grams of a calcium containing diet. In other words, where does the calcium go in their body if you essentially give them the quote unquote recommended two grams going on? So when they gave them 800 milligrams of calcium intake, what they found was that overall, the balance was negative to neutral. What that means is what went in could be equivalent to what came out of the body in the form of urine and stool. So you could measure the input versus the output, and it was almost the same or slightly more for the output going on. Okay, so that's fine. So at 800, that's okay. Let's go to 2000 or more. What happens with 2000 or more? Well, with 2,000 or more, what they found was that they were starting to be what we call a positive calcium balance. How do they know? Because what they saw was that there wasn't an increase in the calcium in the blood. So serum calcium didn't go up. 
Well, that's fine. Maybe it went out in the stool. They checked the stool. It didn't go out in the stool. Okay, so maybe it went out in the urine. They checked the urine. It didn't go out in the urine. So now it's not in the urine. It's not in the stool. And the blood level of calcium hasn't risen. So the question is, is where did this calcium go? And the answer is, it ends up in tissues. And as a result of that, when you look at our dialysis patients, calcium and phosphorus, they precipitate together and they turn into essentially this really hard type structure that ends up forming inside your blood vessels. And when folks who are on dialysis, for example, they have an x-ray, you will see the calcifications, they light up on the x-ray. It's almost like looking at a Christmas tree. This is how substantial it is. And that's actually a really high risk factor for mortality. So high amounts of calcium, especially in patients with increasing kidney disease, they don't actually have anywhere to go and they end up depositing inside tissues. So we want to be careful about this idea of calcium supplementation versus getting our bones to want to take up the calcium that's coming into our bodies. With phosphorus, what becomes interesting about phosphorus is this. Phosphorus is a very unique thing. First, if you don't have phosphorus, you die. If you have too much phosphorus, you also die. But it's not like potassium where the effects are immediate. With phosphorus, low phosphorus can have very immediate effects, but high phosphorus does damage over months to years going on. So what happens there? When you start to talk about phosphorus, what we know is, as your serum phosphorus starts to increase, what happens overall is your risk of death starts to rise. And phosphorus is an additive found in just about every single processed food that's present there. So what we end up seeing is, is all sorts of processed foods have phosphorus and not all different types of phosphorus are the same. And we're going to talk about each type in a second. But what you want to understand about phosphorus is the more phosphorus you get, the more it starts to affect all sorts of things such as bone health going on. Specifically, there's a breakdown of bones going on. Your parathyroid glands start to get stimulated, meaning they can start to get larger going on. There's all these secondary effects that are happening throughout the body going on, and not to mention the calcifications that start along with the calcium in the body. But phosphorus comes in a variety of different types. There's what we call inorganic and what we call organic. And the reason you want to know about this is because inorganic has essentially 100% absorption. What goes in the body, all of it gets absorbed and all of it does all the bad things we talked about. What are those types? You have processed foods, you got all those pre-cooked meals, cheeses, and of course, sodas. Those are your biggest culprits when it comes to understanding the risk of inorganic phosphorus. But organic phosphorus, the advantage that you start to deal with is the fact that you're going to have less than 60% absorption. So whenever you have the option, you always want to prefer organic phosphate over inorganic phosphate simply because there's less absorption. And what are the types of organic phosphate? Well, there's two types, animal and plant-based sources. So what you want to know about both of these types is with animal that's where you have about 40 to 60% absorption. And when you start to look at plant-based though, it's only 10 to 30% absorption. So if you've been listening to the lecture so far, you've heard about sodium, you heard about potassium, you heard about calcium. Now you're hearing about phosphorus. What you're starting to see is a pattern, a dietary pattern that's already telling you from an evidence-based perspective, from hundreds of studies that's starting to show you that as we shift towards a predominant whole food plant-based diet, what you're going to tend to find is that is the ideal diet from a kidney health perspective going on. And that's why we tend to get so excited about this idea. <music>